session today is Next Practices, Case Studies in Energy Innovation. The, purchase, the purpose of our session is to hear from area business leaders about their understanding and efforts in innovative energy technology. Um, I've got enough gray hair that I can become philosophical about things and expect <laughs> Expect people to listen to me, although when I try to do this with my kids, they do to me what Fred just did. <laughs> but one observation I think I can make validly uh, is that what appears in life to be luck, and for that matter in business appears to be luck, is actually preparation. So that when an opportunity arises, you're prepared and ready to seize it. And today, perhaps we'll learn more about some opportunities that might be coming along so that when they uh, when they do appear before us, we'll be ready to seize them. To provide us with the information we need on that, we're lucky to have Fred Keller from Cascade Engineering, Tom Faisenfeld from Crystal Flash Energy, Steve Kenyon from Charlevoix Energy Trading Company, and Frank Remsberg from Meyer. Our first speaker will be Fred Keller. He's chairman and CEO of Cascade Engineering, a leading provider of plastics solutions for the automotive, industrial, and solid waste industries. He's a materials engineer by training and founded the company in 1973 following his early career as a metallurgist with Pratt & Whitney. From its small beginnings as a plastic parts manufacturer, Cascade has grown into a solutions-based organization with 17 customer-focused units and comprising over 1,000 employees in 12 facilities worldwide. Fred serves as a director of Meyer Inc. and the W.K. Kellogg Foundation and is past chairman of the Economic Club of Grand Rapids. He's chaired several community boards. He's following innovative management practices, and his work in sustaining, I'm sorry, in advancing sustainability are featured regularly in business and industry publications. He serves as a visiting lecturer on sustainability at Cornell. He's a Grand Rapids native, earned a Bachelor of Degree in Science from Cornell, and a Master in Science in Business Management from the Rensselaer Polytechnic, Polytechnic, Polytech Institute. When I Googled Fred in preparation for chairing this session, I found dozens and dozens of hits related to the innovation that he personally and his businesses have followed. I think this will be a very interesting presentation. I'm going to introduce the other speakers next so that we can just go right through the speakers and continue with our, our presentations. Steve Kenyon is here from Charlevoix Energy Trading Company. He has more than 18 years of unique, high-quality and dynamic experience in the natural gas energy field. He is registered with the Chicago-based gas technology student as a commercial gas consultant. His extensive energy and natural gas-specific experience includes rate-making, risk management, objectives, implementation, strategic business plans, and tactical execution solutions. He's also been involved in customer consulting and management work throughout the state natural gas procurement, hedging, wellhead pricing, and interstate pipeline and storage analysis, and comprehensive management of customer supplies, storage, optimal rate selections, and successful risk management behind every city gate of Michigan's natural gas local distribution companies. Among his other activities, he is a lieutenant colonel, a 26-year veteran of the Army and Army Reserve. He has held numerous troop command and senior staff positions at the company, battery, battalion, group, and regional medical command units, infantry, field artillery, and medical in the United States and in Europe. Our next speaker will be Tom Faisenfeld. Tom is president of Crystal Flash Energy, a Michigan-based fuels distribution and recycling business serving over 40,000 customers. Crystal Flash has been a pioneer in bringing recycled and renewable fuels to Michigan, including recycled industrial boiler fuels, biodiesel, ethanol fuel blends, and wind-generated electricity. It is currently the leading marketer of biodiesel in the state. Tom is a native of Grand Rapids with an MBA from Michigan. His family has participated in the petroleum industry for five generations, over 100 years, dating back to the first Standard Oil refinery in Cleveland, Ohio. Our final speaker will be Frank Remsberg. Frank has been active with Meyer for over 15 years as manager of site development, energy management, and environmental compliance. His responsibilities include new store development, new store due diligence investigations, all aspects of environmental compliance and energy management for over 170 stores and 150 gas stations. 
Before joining Meyer, Mr. Remsburg was in consulting practice for 15 years in western and southeast Michigan, primarily providing environmental engineering services for the automotive and manufacturing sectors. He has an engineering degree in civil engineering and a master's in environmental engineering from Iowa State University. I'd like to have you all join me in welcoming our speakers. We'll be proceeding one after the other. First, Fred Keller. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Sorry, I didn't mean to do that. Did I do it? I'm going to, I'll, I'll do that. Yeah, sure. Okay, great. Thanks. Well, I'm, I'm really uh, thankful to be here. This is a, uh, a good group. You're all dispersed at this point, so we'll have to walk from both sides to the other side. But, um, and I, I think this, the objective was we were taking a rather large view uh, at the, with uh, uh, VJ's observations uh, to the state view and now maybe more parochial about what we're, uh, what we're doing in, in, uh, in businesses uh, uh, locally. And I, I don't, am I the only one with a, with a PowerPoint? I don't know the rest of it. We're going to do one too. Oh, good. I won't be the only one around here. Um, and I just use this to organize my thoughts a little bit. Uh, really, the purpose of, of the talk I wanted to give this morning is give you our thinking. And, and our thinking really has, at Cassian Engineering, has to be uh, uh, based on this, this broader thought process we, just, uh, we have just heard about. Talk about our strategy. I just want to close briefly with a, a little bit of a West Michigan opportunity or a regional opportunity for us. Um, in general, the thinking I, it really starts with this whole question of, of uh, what's happening to our resources. Um, uh, this is our global consumption of oil. Uh, as you see, it continues to rise. You'll notice the, the uh, U.S. or the North American is on the bottom, and uh, the, uh, uh, th that, that shows that we're continuing to, in to uh, increase our utilization of, of oil uh, as, a, as a proxy for energy. Uh, this is also showing our, our, I like to call it the reduction in inventory. Uh, I, I don't know of any, uh, any oil companies that actually produce oil. Uh, they, they reduce our inventory. It's, it's the global inventory that we're reducing at this point. And uh, you can see that, th that we're increasing our rate of production uh, uh, or increasing our rate of decreasing that inventory. And uh, you'll also note that, uh, that the rate of our ability in, the, in North America at the bottom is going down. Uh, so that, that gives us this, uh, this, by the way, these are all coming out of BP's uh, websites. Great, great website if you ever want to go take a look at their statistical review. Uh, this shows the rela relationship between what they call the reserves to production ratio. And it shows that uh, at the rate that we're pumping in, the, in North America, we've got something on the order of uh, 15 years in reserve. Uh, if you look at the Middle East, which is that green bar, uh, they've got something on the order of 80 years in reserve. You notice on the left-hand side of that, uh, those, those uh, orange bars, that's the, that's the rate at which those reserves are uh, either increasing or decreasing. So generally speaking, over the last uh, number of years, uh, every year we're, we're finding as much as we're, as we're uh, pumping out. Uh, and that's, that, that just gives you a general sense of that. But the fact is uh, that we are not, as a, as a uh, country or as North America, we're not adding to those reserves. So I, I res really resonate with uh, Vijay's uh, thoughts about the idea that we are not going to be energy independent as long as we're tied to oil. But I'll explain a little bit of how that gets parochial in a minute. Uh, natural gas is, is, uh, is another interesting one. It, it's the it's the same kind of thing. Uh, in fact, a little worse for us in, in North America. Uh, it, again, the, the, the far left is North America in, that, uh, in the bar charts, on the vertical bar charts. Uh, and we've got, again, about 15, 20 years of, of uh, gas left in our, in our reserves. Um, and then if you uh, look at the Middle East, it's something on the order of uh, 200 years. Uh, or 300 years, I guess it is, that they've got in, in terms of natural gas. So you can see where, that, where that's going. And this question of, 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 uh, of utilization of these molecules, I mean, we're in the plastics business, and uh, we think about mo the, uh, the, you know, the energy that's consumed, of course, in these things, but it's also, uh, these, are, these are molecules that could be plastic materials that we're just simply burning. And uh, this is a tremendous waste in the conversion uh, to make electricity. 
Uh, it's incredible of how much is, is actually lost. This comes right off the, uh, the U.S. Energy Information Administration. It seems to me incomprehensible that we would waste that much energy uh, in just converting it to electricity, but in fact that's the case. If you look at the relatively small amount of, of uh, uh, energy that goes into actual use, and then you think about the amount that we actually waste of that uh, in, in unnecessary usages, uh, it's, it's uh, mind-blowing that we're continuing to build uh, um, uh, very large and very expensive uh, power plants to waste energy and waste molecules in this way. So that's, that's just my point of view. The other thing is, of course, we're, we're inc increasingly dependent on crude oil, and this is a proxy. Uh, we've been able to uh, be almost the same in natural gas. Uh, we've been able to produce about as much as we use in natural gas. We've had about four uh, liquid natural gas ports that uh, has helped uh, uh, buffer that for us. And we export a little and we import a little, but uh, that's changing now. And, and we're, we're now going to have to build 10 to 12 new deep oil, uh, deep water uh, uh, liquid natural gas uh, ports in order for us to, uh, over the next several years, in order for us to keep up with our demand if we keep going in the, with the natural gas the way we are. And this question of peak oil, I think, was actually missed a little bit. Uh, it's not so much in the, uh, uh, running out of oil. I don't think there's any concern about running out of oil. It's really when the when the, uh, when the demand exceeds the supply rate. And uh, we, we are expected to have somewhere, again, this is uh, pretty reliable Energy Information Administration work uh, that says that we, we would expect to see our demand exceed the rate, the rate of demand exceeding the rate of supply uh, somewhere around mid-century. And, and that's, uh, that's, that's all impacting our world. So, uh, you know, in our world, uh, we're in plastics, so our situation is raw materials are formed from oil and natural gas. That's, that's, that's just fact. Our costs follow oil and natural gas. Guess where our costs are going? Uh, even though our products uh, can be recycled and recycled and then used for heat and energy, which wouldn't that be a great policy, Tom? I think that would be, you know, isn't there, is there a highest and best use of these materials? Maybe. Maybe, that's, they, maybe that deserves some policy thought. And, and so I just, I just end with this little question. Are we the chicken or the, egg, or the pig? You know, the, you know the, the farm story, don't you? About the, how many of you know the farm story? There's, oh, just a few. All right, I'll tell you. Um, well, it's, it's, you know, the farmer comes out and asks the, uh, says he's going to, the, 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 the pig turns to the chicken and says, guess what? He's coming out for, for breakfast again. He says, for you, it's, a, it's a, a just a, a, a contribution. For me, it's commitment. Uh, and, and, and we're kind of in that commitment side. You know, we're tied directly to this. This, is, this impacts us dramatically. So uh, this, is, this is our situation in our plastics industry and in our, in our business in, uh, in Grand Rapids, Michigan. But and the, one of the things I'd, I like to teach when I visit Cornell, I actually did that same course here at Aquinas, uh, but the, the idea is sustainability is a new language. And it's a new language that's catching on. People are beginning to talk about it. You almost can't open up the, the newspaper without somebody talking about some aspect of sustainability. And it is the idea, the language of, of environmentalism, as, as BJ was talking, the, the, uh, the language of environmentalism has become the language of business. And, and that's good. That's good news. And that, that really means that as you look at this rather complex triangle, if you've got your three, thing, the three legs of sustainability, the financial side, the ecological side, and the social side, uh, the, the idea is that there are always places, the best place to start with that, with that uh, quest, if you will, is to put some, 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 uh, some, some goals together, put some uh, objectives together, and you'll innovate your way to making progress. And, and the best way to start with that is, is the eco-efficient or the socio-efficient things to do. Those things that pay you money back and, guess what, move you uh, you're better, more along the, the ecological uh, road or the, or the, the social uh, capital road. So th that's, a, that's a, uh, a program that I think, or a way of thinking that I think is useful. Another one that, that we have uh, uh, used at Cascade is the idea that that we have made some progress over the years uh, as we started out with a kind of a regulatory mindset. Make sure you meet the regulations that the regulators are, are putting in front of you. Don't go to jail. Uh, the, the next step is you, you figure out that if you 
uh, we found out in the 80s, uh, in the 90s, that quality is free, uh, that, that, uh, that safety pays. Uh, these things make good sense so that you go beyond the regulation to, to a, an area that, that you're proactive. And finally, you get to a point where you are thinking about it strategically, that you can build your business around the future that's in front of you from the standpoint of, of, uh, of, of those things you thought were bad or that you had to stay away from, you can actually build a good business around it. So that's what we're doing to transform our business from kind of a, uh, uh, a backwater plastics uh, manufacturing, if you will, uh, to an organization that's being strategic about the future. So what's our response to that? We're reducing, of course, trying to reduce energy, raw materials, scrap, rework, all of those things that, that uh, are good for the environment and good for our bottom line. Uh, we're redefining resources, recycled materials. Uh, 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 we think of them as having more value than virgin material. We, even though they cost less, and they do create, uh, in general, they, they do create uh, value for us, they are, they are difficult to handle. They're, they're, you have to think differently about them. And in the past, it was, it was a matter of, oh, well, let's not worry about that. Let's just stay with the easy one, the virgin materials. But recycled materials are, in fact, uh, uh, we can think of them as more valuable, and we do. And, and, and they're, they're resources, not trash. And how much of that can we use? So, and we want to get strategic about this, and we're setting goals for sustainability. And then there's this other big question out there that's about clean tech. There is more money following clean tech today than you can imagine, and probably than's prudent. Uh, it's going to be, uh, it's creating a tremendous investment bubble. Uh, and you've got folks like uh, Ray Lane, who is the head of Klein Perkins, uh, saying that uh, this is bigger than the Internet, maybe a factor of two or three times bigger than the Internet. Uh, it, it is amazing how much money is, is uh, chasing clean tech. And so our strategy is to re use recycled materials in our products, provide systems that support recycling, and to develop and market products that reduce fossil fuel consumption. That's our response. That's our strategy at this point in time. We, are, we have business plans in place for each one of these, uh, but policy would help. Uh, we could use some help in the policy area. Here's an example of a policy in Brazil. I took this picture. I was just down there this past fall. Gasoline, four sixty-five a gallon. Ethanol, two dollars and eighty cents. Why did that come about? It came about because they made a requirement that ethanol will not be more than seventy percent of the cost of gasoline. They've never had to use that, by the way, but that was it. That was it. That was a requirement. And gasoline is twenty percent ethanol. And I forgot the third one up there is all vehicles must be flex fuel capable. And that drove the market. That's all they needed to do. That's all they needed to do. State incentives, uh, we got a ways to go. Uh, we're, we're not, uh, a lot of other states are there. These are some that have solar and wind. Uh, the greatest incentives are in New York, Delaware, New Jersey, Illinois. Uh, we've got some states, uh, obviously, that, that do, they, they actually favor solar over wind, which is kind of interesting, because solar is not as cost efficient as wind. But there are a lot of states, and California is one of them, that has the, the biggest incentive. 60 to 70 percent of your, of your solar installation can be covered by, uh, uh, by incentives. Um, the right policy will attract manufacturing investment. I think that's the key. Uh, NREL is going to be proposing a 20 percent of the nation's energy uh, coming from of electrical energy, coming from, from uh, wind by uh, 2025. And that would add 500 billion to the manufacturing sector and add 2 million jobs, permanent jobs. Tremendous possibilities. So, what's our point of view? We believe that in renewable energy. We believe that renewable energy is best when distributed. And what, by the way, we believe in renewable energy not because of the environmental benefits, but because of the long-term economic viability. We believe that renewable energy is best when distributed. Uh, large wind solar farms, yes. But ex and in fact, we've done some work with that. My partner, uh, Rich Vanderveen, here, and I have worked at, uh, at, at doing some development in large wind. But there's exciting growth bringing technology to the home and the business. And we believe that Cascade Engineering, as a manufacturer, is perfectly situated to exploit this opportunity. We're going to be designing and manufacturing and sales and marketing. And finally, what we're going to be doing is product development, contract manufacturing, product complete manufacturing and a channel to market, and we're going to be playing in the small wind energy field. 
And uh, we think that this is an area where we can, we can make an impact. We, you know, it's, it's a tiny industry today, $25, $30 million worth of business. And uh, finally, as a regional opportunity, we believe that we should become the clean tech center of the U U USA. We have the, uh, we have the manufacturing infrastructure, infrastructure, we've got the educational infrastructure, and we have the entrepreneurial environment. So that's my thoughts for right now. It's a great story that uh, about uh, where Cascade Engineering is going. I really appreciate the the vision and and the uh, community involvement that you've had over the years, Fred. It's been a, a great part of our community. Um, let me just tell you a little bit about my company. I'm with uh, uh, Crystal Flash Energy, and just to give you a thumbnail sketch of what we are, we're about a um, $200 million a year distribution company. Uh, we don't manufacture. Uh, what we do is we buy fuels and we distribute them. We have a truck fleet of a, about 150 trucks that, that works throughout the state of Michigan. Uh, back in the 80s and 90s and the 70s, even, even before that, uh, we also had a chain of gas stations, and we've now exited that part of the the petroleum distribution business. But I became painfully aware of environmental issues uh, when we had our stations because uh, regulations changed and uh, the government suddenly got much more interested in what was happening with um, contamination from underground storage tanks. And my company, which is not a big company, suddenly found ourselves with about a, uh, a $5 million liability to clean up uh, historical contamination. Uh, some of the, the gas stations that we uh, were in had been gas stations for 30, 40 years. And uh, things happen, and even uh, 100 or 150 gallons of gasoline in the ground can can cost hundreds of thousands of dollars to clean up. So I started to understand that um, there are liabilities the company can create for itself unknowingly using state-of-the-art current uh, environmental practices and that if uh, we wanted to be a viable company in the future, especially seen as how we were in petroleum distribution, which has a lot of environmental issues. We had to start thinking ahead of the curve. We had to start thinking not about how can we uh, meet today's regulations, but how can we set up our business so that we're ahead of what's going to come five or ten years from now, and we're not going to have to go through another issue like we have with our underground uh, tanks. So back in the, the mid-1990s, I tried to educate myself a little bit. Uh, we became one of the founding members of the West Michigan Sustainable Business Forum, which is, by the way, a great organization, and, and anybody in business in West Michigan uh, could benefit by being a part of that. And uh, it's co-sponsored with the West Michigan Environmental Action Council. Uh, so you have both business and environmental uh, group, a, a local, well-respected environmental group coming together to really try and learn more about how we can all become more uh, environmentally friendly and more forward-thinking in a lot of these issues. Well, as I, I worked with that group, uh, one of the things the group came up with was uh, an evaluation form. And you could go through, and this is another great benefit of, of being part of the group. You could go through and you could rate your business based on how you performed all the different processes in your business and come up with an actual numeric score to say where you are in terms of... of um, your environmental uh, practices, 
and then over year the years try and improve that score and and uh, eliminate toxics from your business eliminate waste from your business eliminate liability and things that that cost you a lot of money well as I was working through that with our executives one of the things that um, a little light bulb went on and one of the things that that um, uh, suddenly became clear to me was that the internal processes of our firm uh, which this system really focused on were just a small part of our environmental impact. Being in petroleum distribution, I've, I, it suddenly occurred to me that uh, our total environmental impact, our environmental footprint, as, as people say, probably consisted of 10% by the, pre the internal operations of our company and maybe 90% by the products we distribute. So our environmental impact really could not be adequately addressed just by focusing on the efficiency of our trucks, recycling our light bulbs in the office, recycling our office paper, all of those kinds of things. So beginning in the late 1990s, we really began looking at how can we, over time, help our customers to move to more environmentally friendly fuels because that really was the, the uh, key um, environmental impact that a fuels distribution company has. And uh, it's been an interesting journey. Um, we have sold uh, E85 at we have uh, gotten involved with the recycling of used motor oil. We have uh, worked on the introduction of, of um, renewable electrical energy here in Michigan through wind turbines. We've uh, worked on biodiesel introductions. And one thing I've learned is that the environmental characteristics of a fuel don't necessarily follow right along with the economics of that fuel. And so we've really had to be strategic about which fuels we try and emphasize and, and which direction we go. Uh, right now, um, we have decided, or, or we've set a goal for ourselves that within um, five years, we want to have 30% of our fuels that we distribute here in Michigan be from either recycled or renewable sources. And we're about halfway to that, um, to that level. And, and the um, types of fuels that have gotten us there have not been E85, which today is still um, a bad economic deal for customers because it sells for about the price of gasoline but it only takes you about two-thirds uh, the distance in in your car per per gallon so that 70% uh, discount they have in in Brazil is is about right that's about where e85 should be but what we have found is that um, all of the used motor oil in the state that uh, quite often was not being recycled in a responsible manner is a potential resource for us and for our customers. And we have a fleet of about 10 trucks that go around the state and we collect used motor oil out of car dealerships and out of um, uh, quick oil change places, county road commissions, all the people who change their own oil or, or change customers' oil and bring it back to a, a plant on Alpine Avenue in, here in Grand Rapids and uh, clean that up and it makes a great boiler fuel for industry. It's a, a fuel that 
uh, today actually has more heating content, more energy content than uh, number two fuel oil. And with the right type of equipment and, and the right type of uh, air permit, um, industry can, can use that fuel and has been very successful with it. Uh, right now we do have a research project to go out and collect uh, brown grease from restaurant grease traps and bring that into our, our used oil uh, stream so that we can take another uh, waste product which right now is, is basically landfilled and uh, by the way we'd like Myers brown grease if you have any to spare. Um, but um, it's basically a waste product that is landfilled and we um, believe that that product has the same heating content as our used oil product and can be cleaned up economically to also help power industry right here in Michigan. So we think that's a win for the economy and a win for, for the um, environment. One of the things that we're most excited about is how the um, soy diesel business has developed here in Michigan. There's a lot of different types of biodiesel blends that people have brought to market around the country. But the one that seems like a winner for having uh, consistent product quality, good specs, actually has the same energy content as, as petroleum diesel is um, uh, diesel that's based on, on uh, soy, soybeans. And currently all of our uh, number two fuel oil for home heat, our, all of our diesel fuels are blended with uh, f at least 5% soy diesel. So we have gone over to the point where um, anybody who buys from Crystal Flash Energy today will be buying a blended product including uh, a partially renewable source. Um, customers are having great experience with it. We're currently selling a uh, actually a B99 blend which is 99 percent renewable fuel to fuel um, some of the ships that run over Lake Michigan where um, we have had consistent um, contract with the National Oceanic and, and, and Atmospheric Administration that comes up with our weather forecasts. They have some boats on, on Lake Michigan and we, we've been providing them with, with um, B99, which is 99% soy diesel. Uh, this uh, coming year we're going to be uh, providing the fuel for the Grand Valley State University uh, research vessels out of Muskegon and hope to make your air a little cleaner over there. Um, we're finding a lot of our customers are asking for B20, 20% blends in their trucking fleets and are finding that the some of the cleaning properties of the soy diesel um, are uh, actually makes their older equipment more efficient. It, it cleans up the, the fuel systems and they've actually seen improvements in their miles per gallon. So uh, that is turning out to be a, a, a great step forward for a lot of our customers who by changing over to a, a B20 blend are automatically lowering their, their um, carbon output by 20 percent and also getting a fuel that actually is working a little better for them than a petroleum diesel. So we're excited about all these these trends and I, I think one of the, the things that I'm most positive about is, is the bioeconomy. I, I do believe that by working through a, a lot of um, the issues of bringing um, uh, agricultural crops into our energy mix 
we're really going to be able to stimulate our, our domestic economy, have enhanced energy security, and be able to uh, improve um, a lot of the emissions of all of our businesses. And it's going to happen fast. We really think there's, there's going to be a lot of opportunity for all of us out there to move forward in this area and to, to be part of the solution. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Can you hear me? All right. First of all, I want to say that uh, a real pleasure to represent my company and be here with a lot of really fantastic people, including the panel this morning, and uh, really humbled. Um, and a lot of good things. I agree with most of what I've heard, the most important part being that uh, we are discussing a lot of very important issues, and we've got solutions. We really do. The theme for my quick presentation here, uh, I'm a natural gas guy, and I'll touch on that, but uh, my theme is the reality that the f is that the future looks very bright, so we need to get to work and not sweat the small stuff. Natural gas, and I'll tell you more about our company, but is a traditional fuel, you could say, and uh, definitely has a history. At one time, thought to be the panacea of all goodness in energy, and, and then we found that uh, prices kind of made us think twice about that but still has a future. And just like Tom's business, petroleum, we're a petroleum-based economy. We're transitioning, we're looking and creating better alternatives, absolutely. And these smart kids here at Aquinas College and elsewhere, my kids, your kids, they're gonna figure out these answers. In the meantime, we've gotta, we've gotta be profitable, we've gotta be safe, we've gotta be secure. Natural gas, petroleum-based fuels are part of that, notwithstanding the fact that we wanna explore other alternatives, and we will. Uh, why don't I tell you a little bit about my company, if I can stay on track here. First of all, Charlevoix Energy Trading Company is a member of, of uh, Grand Rapids Area Chamber of Commerce. We're a minority business enterprise, too. Interestingly enough, uh, we're the oldest natural gas marketing company in the state of Michigan, started in 1986. We're the only company left in the state of Michigan. Since 1986, more than 30 companies have, have moved in and out of Michigan. Uh, the poster child, uh, Enron, being the, the one that most people recognize. Uh, companies that have, have moved in here for a period of time to make money and found that they couldn't or otherwise had other problems. That includes uh, Detroit Edison's uh, purchase of what was called Coenergy Trading Company, so they got rid of their gas business. Consumers Energy, which is a really well-run utility. I want to compliment them in a number of ways in their natural gas and their electric business. but. Their company is called Marketing Services and Trade. They divested that many years ago. Um, and just a number of companies that uh, you'd recognize, uh, BP Amico and on and on, they're gone. So aside from ourselves, the only ones that are marketing gas in Michigan are all owned principally uh, utility affiliates from out of state, Baltimore, uh, Kansas City, Indianapolis, and elsewhere. Our so we are a natural gas marketing company. And our customers, I'll tell you about, including Aquinas College here, we do everything to procure their gas, manage their gas, serve them. Long-term contracts, long-term perspectives with our customers for mutual benefits. Our affiliated companies, though, and it gives me a little bit of groundwork or, or some standing for these other topics, uh, Marysville, uh, Marysville Industrial Complex is located near Port Huron. It's 640 acres, which is a square mile. It's the former synthetic fuels plant built by Consumers Energy during the energy crisis in the 70s. Uh, we now own that, that industrial complex and we have two large companies there. Marysville Hydrocarbons is underground salt dome storage, propane and butane, 200 million gallons, uh, the largest storage of propane and butane in a six state region. Our customers for that, um, Shell, Marathon, a couple other oil companies. What they do, Shell has bought up most of the propane business in Michigan, you may know Shell Gas. Uh, we store their propane in the summertime for the winter space heating market. In the winter, that's displaced with butane, which is an automotive fuel, an oxygenator, replacing MTBE, methyl tertiary butyl ether, which is a 
causes, causes groundwater pollution, but oxygenate the gasoline, which Tom's probably well familiar with, uh, during the summer uh, automotive season. The second plant is Marysville Ethanol, the largest ethanol plant in the state. 100 million gallons goes into production in the fall. And uh, right now there's four plants in Michigan online and four that are being built. Ours will be the next one to come online. And that plant is an example too. Uh, these investments, a little over a half a billion dollars in Michigan. All of our investments are here. But uh, for that plant, we already have a five-year contract, a $500 million contract with Marathon for all of that ethanol, Marathon and Shell together. So one of my themes here is the marketplace. Good ideas need to survive in the marketplace. Ethanol is subsidized. There's no doubt about that. Ultimately, uh, these, these uh, ideas, if they're going to succeed, the marketplace has to support them. We also... Another affiliate is called Lucent Energy, and we're in the last process right now, the last steps of uh, uh, buying eight natural gas processing plants in northern Michigan. Michigan has a wonderful natural gas history, but over the last 30 years, it's been what's called Antrim Fuel, which, is a, which is, was supported by tax credits. It's, it's shallow, long-term producing, high water, high carbon dioxide, bearing natural gas in shale, principally in the counties of Mount Morency, uh, uh, Ross Common. Essentially, if you go from the Saginaw Bay Area all the way over to Shanty Creek Resort, which is where our company started. We had 100 wells on Shanty Creek, and then our owner bought Shanty Creek, and since we got rid of that. But um, uh, Antrim Fuel has, as I say, high carbon dioxide, which is corrosive to pipes, so that's got to be stripped out, high water and otherwise. Uh, so we have those eight plants and then eight pipelines in Michigan. The last company is Everest Energy, which is natural gas exploration and production. So we're pretty well versed in all of our investments. Uh, we're privately held, three individuals here in Michigan. Um, Rai Bargava, uh, Shanti Sharma, Dr. Manush Danishvar, PhD, our three owners. Uh, we're here in Michigan. We live, work, play, invest in Michigan, and um, a good future. I want to touch on real quick what I kind of call the seven generations of the natural gas industry in Michigan and then talk briefly on some of our really wonderful customers, including Mr. Keller's company, and, and how, they're, how they've evolved in their use and their, their, their future of natural gas. The, the industry briefly started with manufactured natural gas essentially taking coal and heating it in the absence of oxygen, and there were manufactured gas plants across the country including in Grand Rapids, Muskegon, Detroit. In, uh, in the early 30s, and manufactured gas is relatively filthy, low BTU, unreliable uh, source of a fuel for lighting street lights originally, and some other manufacturing processes, certainly not something that you would cook with because the products of combustion were, were quite filthy. Uh, notwithstanding technology that we've got now, you can, and this gets into some of the other things, the uh, Fisher Trough process, you can turn coal into anything, uh, hydrocarbon ultimately. But uh, the, the, the interstate pipeline or the, the national natural gas industry essentially came about in the early 30s, the discovery of, of very large quantities of, of what we call natural gas, principally methane, a beautiful molecule, one carbon, four hydrogens, that burns clean, relatively clean, carbon dioxide and water vapor as a byproduct, uh, low density. You can't put it in a liquefied natural gas as a, as a technology, but it's extremely expensive. Cryogenic refrigeration, negative 260 degrees. You can't put natural gas in a tank like you can gasoline, so it essentially moves through pipes uh, in the United States. Velocity of molecules moving through pipes. The interstate pipeline system was built across the United States to bring this relatively clean, safe, good new energy to develop the nation. It was subsidized. The interstate pipe uh, production was regulated by the federal government, so there was certainty on risks. The interstate pipeline system was regulated completely by the federal government, so there was certainty in, 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 on risks there. 
again, the choice for the development of the interstate pipeline industry, government could build it. Could be a, could be a government project or a private industry could build it, own it. Neither of those two choices really was good. Uh, government doesn't do well in building, operating efficiently anything, as far as I'm concerned. Private industry has its problems too. They might take risks on safety, they may gouge markets, they will choose to where they, where they will send that gas and otherwise. So it was a regulated environment so people like us could invest in American Natural Resources, for instance, or the Mishwish Pipeline. Mishwish Pipeline was the first pipeline that came from the Gulf of Mexico to Michigan, built by Mish Khan and uh, my former employer. And uh, again, billions of dollars of investment, had to have some reasonable certainty of, uh, to attract investors who had other choices, and it worked. Similarly, similarly in the state of Michigan, for Mishcon to bring gas to communities like Sparta, to bring gas to communities like um, um, Alpino Industrial, they, they had incentives to go there. But, but the regulated intrastate pipeline system, Michigan Public Service Commission, created a similar environment where the public utility was, what, had, a, had a measured requirement and opportunity to make money to bring gas all over the state. If we go back to the Yom Kippur War, 1973, when four Arab nations um, invaded Israel and got beat, but nevertheless, um, the oil embargo after the Yom Kippur War in 1973 and the energy crisis in the United States. Oil goes through the roof. Uh, and uh, we have to do a number of things. And I can remember I was in college and I did a term paper about what was then, uh, that was the front side of the Ice Age predictions, as well as the fact that hydrocarbons, oil and gas in the world was not only, um, uh, was not only um, finite, but it was very, very small and the world was ending. And um, I, I'm, I'm very skeptical of the global warming conclusions uh, that we have today. But nevertheless, we had to be innovative, and we were. And we created things like manufactured gas plants and on and on. Most importantly, regulations were taken off from the production of natural gas, which is generally produced all over the United States, and, but in particular, major regions in the mid-continent, Oklahoma, Texas, uh, Colorado Basin, and especially in the, in the Gulf of Mexico. Regulations on those producers were, that was the first step in deregulation. Investors, go ahead and go to the bank, get your money, and go out there and explore, and you're not limited on your return. And, um, and government's not going to bail you out if you lose all your money. That created, and, and then there was an evolution, actually, partial deregulation of the pipelines, and this happened into the early 90s, and then eventually here, well, it, into the early 80s, I should say, and then 1986 is when deregulation started in Michigan for the, for the utility companies, allowing large users to first go to buy gas and contracts from producers, they still needed to make contracts with the interstate pipeline companies, very cumbersome, long, great for the lawyers, but they were cumbersome contracts because they had to then have a, a, a conduit to bring that gas to Michigan. Now, uh, customers essentially go right to the marketplace and buy their gas. But as that, uh, those price controls came down, we had, going into the early 90s, the natural gas bubble. Enormous amounts of natural gas and no market for it. Investors started getting disincentives because of, uh, because of what kind of price was being paid. And again, when, we, when oil was at $10 and natural gas was at um, 87 cents a million BTUs, $10 a, uh, a barrel for oil, 87 cents a million BTUs for natural gas. Tremendous incentive to use, not much incentive to sell. And uh, in a free market, those, those, that's, that's a scenario that's subject to change, and it did. Uh, so that deregulation period also spawned something else very interesting, the ability to tie down risks for a commodity, whether it's pork bellies or natural gas, 
Uh, the New York Mercantile Exchange started trading natural gas futures contracts in April of 1990. A forum for investment bankers put money in the pot and find parties on opposite sides of risk. And it's had its troubles. It is regulated. It went through its bad times along with the, uh, you know, the, uh, the Enron episode, if I could put it that way. But nevertheless, has provided a forum for predictability. Uh, customers can absolutely, in a legally enforceable contract, uh, isolate their risk for natural gas all the way up to 2012 if they wanted to or any portion of that. There's not much liquidity in the trading that far out. Generally, we're two to three years of, of good liquidity in the marketplace. But that, was the, um, that would have been the fifth generation there. The sixth generation of the industry was the shocks that we saw developing, uh, starting with the related environment in California with electricity in uh, 2000, the Enron and a number of other companies involved in, in some unethical behavior that caused this market to change. Maybe I should back up a little bit and say during the, during the 90s, though, the problem was made in the marketplace. Uh, it was that we had this, uh, it was in terms of electricity production for the future. And the golden child was natural gas. It was only natural gas. Uh, nuclear power was evil in, in the minds of uh, the political environment uh, and unsafe. Uh, clean coal technology was, was just investing further into a fuel that was not good, notwithstanding the fact that we do have 250 years worth of coal in the United States at uh, you know, current production rates. Uh, oil, similarly. Uh, not not uh, favored. Natural gas was favored for all new power production. Why? Because it is clean burning. That's a relative term. Dramatically cleaner burning than oil and uh, and coal. Relatively clean burning. Domestically produced, absolutely, though it's produced all over the world, but certainly our, our capability to produce everything we possibly need for the next 65 years, I will tell you, in proven and, and recoverable uh, probable reserves. Uh, and uh, cheap, it was cheap. Natural gas during the 90s was $2 and a quarter. It was the equili equilibrium price at the wellhead in Louisiana for natural gas, $2 and a quarter. Today, for delivery in April, it's $7.20, I'll tell you. In October of 05, it was $13.91. That changed. Uh, power production created incentives for, but this goes both ways too, for all of these new power plants, and I'll, I'll tell you about one real quick. Still a, a, a marketplace where investors did not have a, a parachute. In, in Zealand, right next to the Herman Miller's plant, their main plant there, our customers, uh, is a large natural gas uh, peaking plant, and the gentleman this morning from the Public Service Commission mentioned or touched on it. It's a 930 megawatt plant, natural gas fired. It was designed to operate 16 days a year and produce enough power at uh, $75 a megawatt versus a current power or projection of maybe $6 a megawatt. It operates 15 days of the year, sedital the rest of the year, and pay off all that debt and make their investors some good money. Uh, those investors did not tie down their risks on natural gas. The plant went into operation in about 2001, I believe, and uh, they lost their shirts, went bankrupt, um, couldn't produce any power at any price. Uh, and since now that, that company was Southern Energy, the largest energy company in the United States at the time, out of Atlanta, they created a deregulated subsidiary so they could keep all of these potential profits. Uh, Mirant Power, that was called, and then they went bankrupt. Now they've since sold that plant. It has a new future, new investors who've looked at that, that pearl and have determined that uh, there's, there's some opportunities there. The good news is going forward for power production, we have a mix, including a lot of tremendous uh, improvements in, in uh, efficiencies with green power, principally, uh, in my mind, wind, uh, though there's others. And so, and nuclear power has a wonderful future. Um, and there's some new technologies for nuclear power, and it is very important. It's about 21% of our electricity right now, and uh, it, it should grow. Uh, it's absolutely the, the least expensive way we can produce electricity. It is the absolute cleanest because there, no, there are no stacks. Uh, uh, the source of energy is, is reliable and cheap, 
and we have to do we have to deal with the spent fuel of course it's it's safe though it's got a safer record than anything else aside from three mile island we get into zero two to zero six we see these price shock price shocks where the natural gas prices went from generally three dollars to an excess of thirteen dollars since that time just some quick numbers uh, from august of, of zero seven to august of zero five uh, Prices have dropped 23 percent, average wellhead prices, and look at the extremes. August of zero, October of zero five to October of zero six, uh, 70 percent drop in price, measuring those two months. It's a dynamic market and uh, industry. Uh, our current situation, the last generation, is that now we have domestically produced natural gas, which is constrained dramatically. Not the reserves, but it's constrained for environmental reasons, political reasons. The Canadians are exporting less gas than they have in the past because they're producing their power of natural gas going forward. So we have a resurgence of liquefied natural gas coming in to fill one of, one of two needs. We have, we have a, a price need or a, a, an economical price need, but more importantly, we have a supply need. So liquefied natural gas, which is a world commodity, LNG is, uh, is produced all over the world. It's a waste byproduct of oil, primarily. Uh, wasted in the sense that markets are not close to where it's produced. So uh, at certain economies of scale, it can be billion dollar investments, cryogenically refrigerated, as I said, liquefied, negative 260 degrees, and you take a uh, density of one cubic foot at atmospheric to 600 cubic feet in that same volume put in tankers that hit the high sea, principally use, or generally carrying about four billion cubic feet apiece, and they hit the high sea and they head for Japan. Japan is entirely 95% sourced that way. Europe and America. And, uh, but when those ships go down the high sea, the captain can get the call, hey, Europe's gonna pay you more, so change direction, not the United States. What's going on, real interesting, Right now, real time, our energy prices, natural gas, about $7 on average right now. In Britain, $3 for the same amount of fuel. They just came through a very warm winter. Uh, a lot of liquefied natural gas is produced in the North Sea and other domestic sources of natural gas. Britain and Western Europe are not, a, not in need for liquefied natural gas in the summer. So a lot of that's coming to the United States as the... Uh, as the um, uh, the last resort, if you will. So that's good for prices. But my point there, we're, we're in a little bit more of a global sourcing scenario for the next uh, maybe 10 years as LNG. It had been 2% of our supply on average for the last five years. It looks like it may grow to as much as 10% over the next 10 years. And then if I may real quick, how am I doing on time? Okay, um, let me talk about a couple of customers. I'm sorry. Okay, I'll go real quick. Let me tell you about uh, just a few customers. Maybe this can stimulate some questions uh, going on. With natural gas uses, ca uh, usage, uh, Cascade Engineering, we serve Fred's uh, facilities, and they're contiguous and, and uh, uh, five plants contiguous. Uh, just the bottom line is they, they've expanded their, their use or they've expanded their operations quite a bit over the last three years and dropped their natural gas usage by about 30%. That's great. That's good for them. It's good for us. We're happy to have them as our customer. Aquinas College, another example, Aquinas has, uh, and they've continued to expand, including this building. When this came online, I was involved in some of the things they did here, but they're going down by about 15% over the last three years. They're just using natural gas much more um, economically. And um, we've got some more projects going here. Kelvin College is interesting, and for those of you that may know Dr. Uh, Biker, Ph.D., uh, president of Calvin, he's a gas guy. He was a senior executive, one of the largest gas companies in uh, uh, in uh, Houston before he came back to Calvin. He's a local guy, by the way. He's an infantry officer in uh, Vietnam. He's a he's an army veteran. He was decorated in Vietnam. He's a good he's a good man, very smart. He also owns a very large uh, uh, natural gas production company in Indonesia. He's still a gas guy, and uh, runs a good college. They have a cogeneration system there. They put in place in the 90s, that was before Dr. Biker, uh, they, they, uh, they paid for a Cadillac engine. It's a Cooper 12-cylinder large oil field engine. Cost them a lot of money. Paid for itself in two years. 
and they produced at that time as much as 30 percent of their electricity. They did it for reli reliability reasons. Consumers Energy has them on a couple of legs for electricity, and uh, uh, they can base load all of their essential computer systems and otherwise on their own generation of uh, electricity. That engine, uh, the waste heat goes into a boiler along with jacket water, and they have absorption cooling, which on the scale that they're doing it, absorption cooling in the summer, and then uh, heating, of course, space heating. The last several years, they've turned the engine off. It's paid for itself. They've done their maintenance. And now we're looking at turning their engine back on this year so they can displace. It's a perfect example of being able to displace energy. They will, they, if things work out, they'll buy less electricity from consumers, buy more gas from us, which we appreciate, and they'll produce power in their net effect. They'll co-generate. They'll get heat for cooling and heating as well as electricity at a, at a lower cost than buying the two separately. Uh, University of Michigan is a large cogeneration system. They're buying about $20 million a year of gas from us and, and uh, producing electricity. Herman Miller Corporation has uh, displaced uh, waste wood to a large extent, environmental reasons, using natural gas more. The Meridian plant in Zeal up in uh, Grand Haven, some things they've done, efficiencies. All of our customers are using less, but they're more competitive, and that's good for both of us. Last one I want to touch on, a unique company that uh, Tom may be familiar with. Uh, Zealand Farm Services is right at the exit of 96 in Zealand. Um, Family-owned company, uh, Cliff Mewson, we work with them. Largest uh, soybean processor in, in quite a large, certainly in the state of Michigan. And they're producing biofuel, biodiesel, I should say. What they've also done, though, it's another great example. They have, they used to use about um, 30,000 MCF, 1,000 uh, cubic feet of gas per month, natural gas. Uh, four years ago, they, they studied the economics and they came to the conclusion, put up the investment. They built a pipeline to a landfill about two and a half miles away, counting landfill. They've got six miles of pipe that they own. They've got other controls, they've managed the risk, so they've got reliable landfill gas that is about, I think it's about 83% methane versus 94% regular natural gas. But they're now using that for about 90% of all their energy usage is landfill gas. That methane, by the way, if it escapes to the atmosphere, which it does generally, getting into the global warming thing too, uh, methane has 20 times the heat trapping capability of carbon dioxide. So if we're concerned about carbon dioxide in the atmosphere causing the atmosphere to be warmer, we should definitely be concerned about methane. Methane is escaping in the atmosphere all the time. Those landfills included. Coopersville is another good example. They run a four meg oh, uh, 1 1.6 megawatt generation cogen that they're running off this as well. Uh, so it's, a, it's, a, it's an interesting uh, combination of a number, number of things there. I think I'm done. Thanks. Or less. <laughs> yes. Could you hold it up? Yeah. Um, I wanted to give you um, a case study in what Meyer has undertaken over the last few years. And I think it's fair to say that nothing sharpens the business practice more than competition. And um, Meyer has recognized some serious competition, especially in the last few years. And of course, we, we also recognize our energy costs are a significant factor of our business. So we have undertaken a lighting project that was started actually in 2000. And at that time we recognized that most of our stores were lit with a, a fixture called an HID fixture, a high intensity discharge fixture, which has a dome shape, um, a metal halide type um, a light source. It um, uses 450 watts each. And uh, we saw a great opportunity if we could switch out those fixtures to a fluorescent technology. And um, so now we are, we are uh, I think every store is now complete in a lighting retrofit. Here's uh, some of the facts and figures behind it. Um, the 450 watt fixture that we replaced had a, a lamp life of 18 months. We now have a T8 fixture in which is a six watt lamp and um, it, it's a one for one replacement. 
If uh, you could advance the next slide for me, please. Oh, there it is. That's uh, an example of the new fixture in the next couple. Again, the same fixture, a nice clean look, less glare than the old HID. And one more, please. The scope of our project was um, 160 stores. You, did you skip ahead one or did I get out of order? Okay. We have uh, an average store is uh, 200,000 square feet and 32 million square feet in total that we retrofitted. That represents 83,000 fixtures, so big numbers. So, could you go to the next one? There we go. The new fixture, as compared to the, uh, the old fixture, the before and after shows uh, significant light levels. I'll let you read the, the numbers, but vertical light measurements isn't as useful as a horizontal. So the bottom line shows that we had a 55% increase in light levels by changing this fixture. The fixture improves the, the uniformity, it improves uh, the light levels by 50%, and the lamp life is extended from 18 months to three years in comparison. So it was a tremendous improvement in all aspects, from energy to um, the visual appearance of the product that, that we're selling. The first year we did a four-store test. It was in 2001, and it was about an average cost of $160,000 per store. We saw an energy savings of about $75,000 per year in energy. So it had a little over a two-year payback. The second year, we negotiated for a little more refined fixture, lower cost. We got better with the installation. We drove that, uh, that uh, installation cost down significantly, and the, re and the return on investment shrunk to 19 months. And then from years uh, four and five, I believe it was, uh, we sharpened the pencil even further with a lower cost fixture and got it down to a 14-month payback. So just a fantastic energy project. Uh, I think lighting is one of those that offers the, one of the best opportunities because of the advance of technology. And for all of your businesses, I'd suggest that it's a great area for low-hanging fruit from an energy savings perspective. Uh, I think one more slide. Our total project cost $12.5 million. We estimate $9.5 million per year in energy savings. So. There's the numbers, and it's a project that's uh, we're delighted with uh, with the outcome. And I'll let us take questions or go to lunch. Thank you very much. Brian. Questions for any of our panelists. Well, that's changed dramatically. We started out at about five or five and a half cents. It's now about six and a half cents. And that's based on, on the use of power day and night, which, you know, the 24-hour operation makes a huge difference in the power cost. But six and a half cents is the, is the numbers today. It is custom. It is uh, commercially available. There's a number of manufacturers that have it now. Yes. I have a question for you, Frank. Also. Yes. Uh, is it more difficult to dispose of the fluorescents? Uh, it is better today with uh, disposal, but the mercury content in fluorescence is a big issue. Uh, the ones that have the green tab at the end, called the eco-friendly, are supposedly landfill safe. They still have mercury content in them, but it's below a standard that the federal government has determined safe. Our practice has been to recycle all lamps, uh, in other words, to capture the mercury because of uh, uh, the implications if it leaks out of the landfill, whether small quantities or, lot, or large quantities. But uh, new fluorescents are landfill friendly according to the federal government.